This is part of a track called the CMO's Guide to the Subscription Economy. And I'm Joe Andrews, and I'm joined by Brian Bell, our CMO, up at the front here. And we're a little bit short on time because, because of the keynote and going into lunch. We're going to try to keep this to an hour. Um, I am going to present a short presentation, teeing up the pricing and packaging concepts. And then we'll have Brian bring up our panel here. We have some great marketing leaders uh, from a number of our customers uh, talking about what they're doing in terms of innovative pricing and packaging strategies. So again, thanks for joining. We welcome you here. A uh, little background on, about me. I've been here uh, just since the beginning of the year. Uh, my career has largely been spent in large uh, traditional software companies where we've uh, priced using a perpetual license model, uh, the last of which we went through you know, a painful conversion to, to start down the path of, of going to a subscription model um, without the benefit of having Zora. And, and so that's really what excited me about the opportunity here today. Um, I think all of us relate, right? We're all here. We have a vested interest in the subscription economy. Um, not just our businesses, but especially as marketers. The real opportunity to be able to transition from selling products one time, right, to one customer at a time, to building a sustainable relationship, a mutually, benef mutually beneficial relationship over time with that customer, where they pay you more and more over time based on the value that you continue to deliver to them. You know, what, what could be better than that as a marketer? So we start with what all marketers care about, right, in supporting the company goals, which is how do you drive growth for your business, right? And in the subscription world, there are three, really three levers to driving growth. It sounds very basic, right? You acquire new customers, and a lot of us, especially when we get out the door with our, with our new company, our new product, new, new subscription business, that's where we focus. You can increase the value of your existing customers, and that's what we want to do over time to nurture and, and develop you know, more enriching relationships with them. And you can reduce churn. And churn is very important in a subscription business. All of these things have to be balanced. And you may invest in some of these areas versus others um, at different points in your life cycle. But they're all important right, for the subscription model. Um, and pricing and packaging plays a very important role. Um, so we're, what we're going to talk about here today are uh, two of the nine keys to subscription success. One around pricing, how do, you, how do you start to price, right? And then how do you iterate and evolve your pricing model over time? As a marketing leader, right, these are some of the things that you probably contend with in your pricing strategy, right? How do you balance growth and revenue? Um, how do you improve time to market and operationalize your pricing? How do you think about choice versus simplicity? Do you price for new accounts, existing accounts? And how do you price against the competition? These are considerations that you wrestle with daily, and you have to think about what's most important, important for your business at your stage of growth. Stepping back a little bit, uh, and Teen talked about this, right? Pricing in the product world. He showed the little uh, flash storage drive. Um, typically cost plus, right? You, you know your manufacturing and sales cost. You set a price to sell it to in the market based on earning a, a certain profit margin. Over time, you know, that cost can decrease, and that's the expectation. But you basically have two levers to play with, right? Um, co manufacturing cost and product quality. And if you're in the software world, where I've spent most of my time, you know, it's, it's not based on manufacturing cost. It's based on willingness to pay. Right? How, what's the, cu the customer willing to pay for that software license? And you, know, you all, I'm sure many of you have spent time in that world, right? typically have done this through very extensive and expensive market research. And typically, you don't change your pricing right, that often. Right? Maybe in, in, the, in the traditional software world, right, every year or two. It's tied to the software development life cycle. Um, but the key is really in how we shift this thinking over to the subscription model. In the subscription world, right, pricing is based on recurring usage. Um, we talked about a couple of different ways to price. It can, you can price by users, you can price capaci by capacity, but it's essentially your, you have a number, set number of customers 
and you have a time horizon with which to monetize them. We talk about four basic price metrics in the subscription economy. When you sell products, you have a one-time price. That's pretty clear. When you're in the subscription world, you can look at things. You still may set, sell one time if you have a, a you know, hard good or something that you're charging an upfront fee. But then you have these, these recurring models, either a fixed recurring model. Um, you could do per unit, per user model, um, like a Salesforce model. Or you can do, do usage model based on, on the presumed value that your customers are getting out of using your product. Another thing about the, the subscription economy is that your consumers have unique needs. Think about the services that you consume. Right? You want to be able to uh, define the parameters of how you consume right, your news subscription, your gym membership, um, your mobile phone plan, your Salesforce edition. Right? And your needs as a consumer change over time. Right? We, we saw this example from Andrew Lampotang this morning. Um, but what if you want, in, in the newspaper world, right, physical newspaper delivery only on weekends now? And you want digital delivery for the rest of the week? If you go on vacation, you want to change that. So how do you do that? How, as a consumer, you want that flexibility. As a vendor, you need to be prepared to be able to deliver on that flexibility. And lastly, it's a competitive dynamic market. Um, in the mobile uh, world, we've all been uh, conditioned to have these two-year agreements right, to, to subsidize the cost of your phone. Well, just a few months ago, T-Mobile came out with this plan where you can subscribe to the phone a la carte right, as an added element of your service plan, not locking you in. So all the other vendors, you know, AT&T responded almost immediately. But they needed the capability to be able to support that. And as we said, you know, in the product world, you had these two dimensions, product quality cost that determine your pricing strategy. In the subscription world, your pricing strategy is a competitive differentiator. And it's really a strategic weapon for you to go out and, ach and achieve your growth goals. We showed this slide this morning. Um, there are a lot of strategies available to you in the pricing world. Um, and you can see, as you, you know, evolve in business maturity, there are a number of things that, that you can focus on, right? From additions to um, usage and overage models, international pricing. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on, on uh, free trials and freemiums. We're going to talk a lot about that in our panel. Uh, but the challenge is, where do you focus and start, right? How, how do you separate, right, what you need to do to successfully launch versus what you're going to iterate on and do over time. Well, this is not where we think you should start. <laughs> DirecTV, um, I'm sure they've done extensive research and they have tons of customer data and they've got it dialed in. They're optimizing for each pixel on that website. Uh, but they've got a mix of, of strategies here, right? You know, time bound, additions, bundles, and this is just above the fold. You go down, you can bundle additional services, and it keeps going and going and going. Well, most of us are not there yet. So where do you start? Well, it sounds very basic, but the key is to start very simply, and then you iterate over time. I know that sounds like motherhood and apple pie, but it can't be, for, it can't be you know, more closely aligned to the truth. Um, a lot of people don't know Netflix started with a basic per user, per rental uh, charge model, and not the flat subscription fee per month that we're all used to now. And it took them over a year to eventually get to that model. But they tested and iterated several times to get there. And that's the key for all of us. Where do you start? If you're new at this, this is Jimdo, one of our customers. Um, they, they focus on uh, website development and hosting. Um, focus on what your core value prop is for your target customers, right? They, have, they picked two target segments. They identified a simple recurring uh, pricing model, and that's what they launched with. And as you iterate, you can add more basic options. A lot of focus on promotional strategy. Right? Fusebox, who, who's represented here on our panel, um, has a free trial offering. Inside View, who's also here, has a freemium model. There are trade-offs to each of those. 
right? And you need to, to think about what's best for your business. I'm, you know, I'm confident we're going to have a good discussion on that today. Just a quick show of hands. Who is using a, a freemium or a free trial model today in their business? Wow, all of you. Free trial, freemium, a little less so, both. OK, that's a good mix. So you guys are, have started down the path of, of experimenting with this and uh, I'm sure have brought a lot of good learnings, right? Do you, do you want to provide uh, full functionality, right, and have it time bound so you can give your users a good experience and then you have to consider, you know, how do you make that experience for your customers in terms of onboarding to the full service um, over time a good one so that they don't walk away, right? Or do you, or do you offer a subset of the functionality and um, the, the upside is you can get a lot of new users, but, but the risk is that, uh, you know, they don't move off that plan and it's hard to monetize them over time. In addition, we have you know, a bundling strategy. This is your one plus one equals three model, um, typically used for companies that want to cross-sell new offerings. It's also used uh, pretty extensively by companies that want to bundle services. Um, so how to, how to increase that attach rate and drive, again, additional value to your customers over time. Then you can look at longer-term options, right? How do you provide price incentives to lock in customers. I know lock in is a bad word, but how do you get them committed and engaged um, to be your customer for a longer period of time? And then over time, you have more advanced options. Usage-based pricing, uh, this is used a lot in the, in the cloud services market, um, infrastructure as a service, um, where you, know, you have a very complex metric, like compute capacity. And the, the challenge in a new market, a nascent market, is how do you get customers um, how do you help customers avoid the risk? They don't know how much they're going to need. You want to get them in the door, and you want, you want to show that, that they're getting the value out of their usage. You can also add you know, a, an overage model um, where you can tier up usage based on your uh, sweet spots for your customers. And then finally, international pricing. Um, you know, companies face the, the need as they as they expand their, their global uh, footprint to be able to offer potentially different price lists, different options to different markets. Um, and again, the ability to support that in your infrastructure, in your processes, um, is really critical to you. But these, uh, these options are available to you as marketers, right? If you've come from the traditional product world uh, like me and like a lot of us, you'd, it was really hard to have these options, right? It took you six months to roll out a pricing change. Um, but here, that's not the case, right? When, when you're in the subscription world and you have a, a platform like Zora underpinning that. Another big topic we want to talk about, and this is key, this is the iterate key, is once you go down the path of, of launching your initial offering and you want to go back and you want to make some of these changes, you want to launch into a new market, you want to address a competitive situation, um, you, want to, you want to do a promotional test, right? How do you, how do you test and, and learn and iterate and roll that into your business. These are important considerations. Um, and again, it was very com used to be very complex to set up an A-B price test on the web. Now you can go in and set up you know, two price plans in Zora very easily, right? And be able to measure that, that response in, in a few days and make some de real-time decisions. And the key is we need to shift our mindset as marketers. This is no longer about, oh, I'm going to develop my one-year plan and we're going to test A, B, and C. This is about how can you test real time, right, and, and learn and roll that back into your business and improve your business? And the last point I want to share is, is an important consideration for us as marketers is we do need to think through how do we implement these changes with our customers, right? Um, there, there are a lot of uh, stories out there where, you know, price changes were not effectively communicated. Um, or you may, ha you may have legacy uh, customers that you want to grandfather in to their old pricing model um, so that you can maintain their loyalty over time as you maybe right, raise your prices. Um, or you know, you, you're doing a, a change and you need, to con you need to communicate it out. There are also a lot of operational considerations to support that. So take this, take this point very seriously in terms of how you talk to your customers and communicate changes effectively. We are in a very fortunate position at Zora, um, you know, we've talked very closely to over 500 customers. Um, and we've, this is, you know, a very c condensed snapshot 
of these learnings. Um, but you know, we've been able to really see firsthand what all of you as customers and prospective customers hopefully are, are doing in your pricing world, right? And, and this is a summary of what I went through, right? Pricing and packaging is, is now a strategic weapon for your business. It is a competitive enabler and differentiator for you. And that's why we're excited as marketers. We're at the forefront again of driving new strategies, right? Start simply, it's very basic, but then iterate over time. Four basic pricing metrics for your subscription business. I mean, there are, there's a menu of hundreds of different ways you can price. But think about the four basic uh, measures. Leverage a free promotional strategy. We'll get into that in a minute here. Right? Freemium, free trial. That needs to be an important part of your customer acquisition strategy. Test, 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 test. Learn, iterate, you know, get qualitative feedback from your customers, but also get quantitative tests to validate uh, your hypotheses and roll that out into your plan. And then be mindful of how you communicate your changes to these customers so that we can all be successful as companies and as marketers in the subscription economy. So I just went through that very quickly, a lot faster than planned, but I know you wanna get to, to seeing the panel and uh, learn from all of the great things that they have to share. So I'm gonna turn it over at this point to Brian, who will, uh, Come up here and, and introduce the panel. All right. Thank you, Thanks, guys. Brian. Thanks a lot. Great. All right. Uh, by the way, there are more seats up here. Folks in the back want to sit down. There are some seats here in the front. Um, so we're going to see how well everyone's mic'd up, right? So hopefully everyone can hear the conversation. And, and also, if you want to move up to get to see the panel, you might want to do that as well. Let me introduce the, the five panelists. We have a great. Uh, group on the panel today. These are, these are people that have been uh, in, in multiple growth businesses um, and have some really good insights. So let me, let me invite them up. Greg, do you want to join from Demandbase? Take a seat up here. Let me call your name and then we'll, we'll do more formal introductions. How many seats do we have here? Let me, let me grab. Yeah, you know, take, take these seats. I might stand. Um, uh, Aaron from Fusebox. Uh, Brian Kelly, CMO of Inside View. Uh, Bill from Marketo and Chris from MuleSoft. Thank you all for, for taking the time. Um, this is really a session for, for you guys. Um, I can tell you the wealth of information that these guys have is tremendous. So use this as an opportunity to ask questions. If you have a question, I'm sure other people do as well. Um, to begin, I gave very brief introductions. Why don't we start and each of you just take a minute and describe a little bit more about um, the companies that you're in. Not everyone knows uh, all of your organizations. And, and then I'll come around and talk about your strategies for growth and how pricing fits in. Do you want to start, Greg? So I'm, uh, I'm Greg Ott. I'm CMO for Demandbase. Uh, I also manage product management, uh, install-based accounts, and professional services. Uh, Demandbase is a marketing platform that allows you to do ad targeting and website optimization based upon the identity of the company visiting the website. So we have a proprietary technology to identify companies of otherwise anonymous visitors. Great. Aaron? Hi, uh, I'm Aran Steigman, and I run product and user experience at Fusebox. Fusebox is an online meeting and collaboration offering. We just raised uh, a new round of funding and launched a big freemium offering. I'll talk a lot more about that. Brian. Go ahead. Brian. Hi, I'm Brian Kelly. I'm the CMO of Inside View. Uh, Inside View is a uh, provider of information uh, about companies and contacts in your target market. And we provide that to uh, marketing and sales and account managers uh, so that marketing can provide uh, more and better quality pipeline. Sales can uh, close more deals, make more money. And account managers can grow uh, and retain their, uh, their customers and install base. Excellent. Bill? I'm Bill Bench. I lead the sales team for Marketo. Uh, Marketo is a marketing software platform, which is really a single system of record for uh, all of your marketing needs, whether your uh, marketing mix includes uh, things like Facebook and Twitter, whether it's email, whether it's digital, whether it's offline. It's a place that's a single system of record so that the marketer has the ability to manage their marketing mix and uh, provide better quality leads over to their sales team. And Chris? company called MuleSoft here in the city. Uh, we're a, what traditionally has been known as a middleware company. 
um, but our, our focus is on connecting SaaS applications in the cloud to the big enterprise uh, and trying to make that as easy as it is connecting people on Facebook. So that's kind of our mission in life. Um, I run our uh, Cloud Hub business and also business development. Great, thank you. Great group. You know what, do you guys want to spread out a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, I feel too. like you all look so, did anyone else <laughs> notice that? I'm like, I'm glad I'm not sitting down there, at least you got it. Spread out, let's make this a little more informal. Um, let's start with growth strategies. Um, you know, in, in Teen this morning talked about, um, you know, how pricing and packaging can align to, to business strategy. You know, are you, go, are you out there trying to aggressively acquire new customers? Are you trying to beat the competition? Are you trying to uh, take market share, uh, et cetera? There's multiple strategies. Why don't we just go through each of you again as this first question and, and just elaborate a little bit more about you know, what you're trying to achieve in your business and then how pricing and packaging supports that. Should we start with you, Greg, again? Sure. Yeah. So um, we basically like to use uh, subscription to our platform. Our growth strategy generally is land and expand in that we sell separate modules. Each one is a separate subscription. So we uh, start out customers um, using any one of our modules to start optimizing their marketing based upon company identity. And then we cross sell or upsell additional modules, mm -hmm. which are additional subscriptions. So the growth strategy is really multiple products all adding to, to uh, higher and higher ARR. Yeah, Do with per customer. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so the, our, we've simplified it, generally speaking, to largely an all-you-can-eat. So each module has an all-you-can-eat price. And then based upon the use of one module, we enter, uh, get them interested in the, in the next module. So one module would be being able to optimize your website content. Another module would be to optimize your marketing automation right. platform. Right. That would be, those would be incremental subscriptions and those, those become additive in a, from an ARR standpoint. Got it, got it. It's all about nurture. That's it's all about nurture. Thinking. Yep. Yeah. Aran? So uh, we, you know, we've done a lot of, we've evolved through a bunch of different uh, pricing strategies. Our, from a growth perspective, our, our focus is really winning enterprise-wide accounts. And so it's, it's a land and expand as well, um, but focused very much so on getting the entire organization. And so with that, you know, we have an individual offering. A lot of our pricing and packaging is really derived from how do we get, what, what are the, what's the best way to optimize in order to get that enterprise-wide conversion? And so we try and make it very, very simple and easy for people to get started. Virality becomes something that's very important. So that notion of simplicity that was talked about earlier in terms of keeping the pricing options very simple, just getting people to adopt, use more and more is the thing that that drives a lot of our, our decisions from a pricing yeah. and packaging perspective. Simplicity. There's always this trade-off that we can come back to between simplicity and you know offering this you know choice, yeah. right? And, and maximize it, right? Simplicity is yeah. going to leave something on the table. That's right. Yeah. Right. Because you see you're kind of trading what's yeah. the fastest path versus right. what's the, the highest. Yeah. Path. Yeah. 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 That's right. Great conversation, uh, Brian. Yeah. So we're clearly in customer acquisition mode as well. Uh, we. Um, our growth strategy is uh, also land and expand, um, but also a lot of emphasis put on uh, a self-service model where we're doing a tremendous amount of content inbound marketing mm -hmm. uh, to drive people to our website. And that's where the, the freemium model has uh, really been a driver of success for our, our growth. Um, so in the small, small business sector, um, sometimes we're, we're finished there where mm -hmm. they, uh, they get as many seats as they're going to get being the size they are. But in the enterprise, they go through the self-service, and then we nurture that along uh, to grow to hundreds and thousands of seats mm -hmm. uh, based on the, the adoption that we've got from the self-service model. Yeah, great. Yeah, I want to come back to that when we go through on, on just strategies with freemium and, and free trial. That's a, a big Yeah, one. we've yeah. Uh, we've been doing free since about 2008. Um, and uh, we're about ready to, uh, to switch the model uh, slightly. Yeah. Uh, based on learnings, and we're in the, the middle of an A-B test, uh, which is proving uh, positive towards uh, our, our uh, strategy on changing the pricing. That's great. That's we're great. going the other way. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we're going from Let's hold on. I want to come back to this yeah. free trial freemium thing. Let me get through. Uh, Bill, do you want to talk a little bit about Marketo's strategy? I know you've gone through a couple iterations. Yeah, Marketo really prescribes to the shifting idea that the buyer is in much more control today before they get to your salesperson, meaning that your buyer is finding you and they're much better educated than they used to be because of the power of the tools of the web. And that's why when I gave my intro, I said, whether it's online, offline, social, it doesn't matter what source they're coming from. Yep. A lead doesn't know it's coming from 
from social media versus an offline trade show drop, you know, business yeah. card drop. And so Marketo's whole approach is to make that frictionless. And so we post our pricing up on the website with a real emphasis of transparency to try and make that process for the buyer easy to happen as they come and try to procure information about your company, research and compare you against your competitors, and then ultimately buy. Great. Transparency. And Chris? Yeah, so I mean, all of us, I think our, our strategies are grow, 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 right? Yeah. Um, so we have sort of three phases. We have an yeah. adoption phase, uh, a land phase, and an expand phase. Mm -hmm. And we have different tactics around pricing and packaging that go in the different phases. You know, being, being more of a technology uh, company as opposed to an application, these guys are all applications. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we sell to developers and IT, and um, you know, we sell against our Oracle, IBM, Tibco, and, and uh, we don't have a, a heavy sales rep presence to go take them golfing and all that, so, and we're, we're a subscription model, so we don't have the economics to you know, suck 50 million bucks out of them up front either, so right, right. Uh, to afford the golf. But um, so for us, it's all about, similar to Bill, it's all about empowering uh, the users and then the word of mouth model. There's nurturing of that during the adoption phase. And then there's a, there's a land phase. Um, and then, you know, then subsequently, there's usually a big expand phase. And our pricing strategy on expand is our pricing model is all around mm -hmm. consumption. So if you use more of our stuff, you'll buy more, you'll, you'll need more. Uh, uh, capacity and so, um, and, and that those three phases have been quite successful for us uh, in, in all three phases over the last let's say three years. We've kind of really been nailing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let's go back. I like the model. Is it adopt, land, and then and then expand, right? Nurture yeah. essentially. Um, let's go back to this acquisition and this free premium free trial. I was amazed actually. I don't know if you guys saw. Did you see the hands? How many people do freemium or free trial? Uh, there were a lot of freemiums. Does someone want to just explain the difference between freemium and free trial? Does anyone know? That, yeah, Aaron, you want to? Freemium, I guess, yeah. is you, you have value forever. It's, free trial has an explicit end date, whereas with freemium, you have a free offer that, that extends over the lifetime. Yeah, and often the freemium has some sort of reduced set of functionality, right? That, that it can. Leads, right, not necessarily, yeah. but often that's, that's yeah. part of the strategy. So let's go back. You know, Brian, you had mentioned you're moving. I think you had said you're moving to... Uh, a free, was it a free trial or a freemium model? Uh, we are at free. You're at free. Uh, we're freemium yeah. right now. Okay. Um, and we're tweaking it a little yeah. bit. I, I won't say exactly what we're going to end up at. Yeah. Um, Is this there, the one you're change. testing right now? Part of the yeah, test that you're so doing? Yeah. So we launched in 2008, and the approach we took and the reason we did it was for option, mm -hmm. uh, adoption and awareness. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, it is the number one lead source uh, for us. It's driving people to the, the free product. Um, from a completely self-service perspective, about 2% of the free trials uh, convert in a self-service to uh, paid. Um, about 12% of our ACV for uh, 2013 uh, started in free and converted mm -hmm. over to paid. So it's very successful. I think mm -hmm. it's a um, uh, paid to free is about 20% ratio uh, right now. So it's been extremely successful. The problem that we're facing is that it turns out that free is good enough for uh, too many yeah. of, our, of our users. And the way we packaged free originally was that uh, we had features that we just didn't provide in free. And so they're using the features that are in free to their full capacity um, on a very frequent basis and getting a lot of value out of that, and, uh, which is fine, but I don't like that. Um, <laughs> I want them to pay. So, the A-B test we're doing right now is uh, why hold back free? I'm kind of like, yeah. you know, um, if there are features um, that we're holding back, how do they experience the value of that and get into a state of wanting? You know, it's like you don't know how much you want the microwave until you have it, right? So, um, you know, what we're doing is we're giving them full functionality in free, but putting limits on our key high value uh, features that are relatively low. So that if you are a frequent user, you're going to hit these and be left in a state of realizing the value and wanting more. And what we've done is you, when you hit that limit, um, you know, it says, hey, here are three of these things that are of high value. Upgrade now and we'll give you 17 more right. uh, of these great value things that we've found and making it very easy for them to convert. Um, so we've done A-B testing on this and we've already seen about a 12% increase in conversion 
on the new model that has full functionality with, with limit 12 set. Twelve percent versus what you had seen yes. today. Yeah. yeah. So basically, you're giving them, you're actually letting them taste these things. It's not exactly. that you're keeping the functionality out exactly. in this new model. You're letting them actually sample it, and then they hit a wall, and that that sort of would then throw them over to right. the, the wall and, 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 all, and want them to, or yeah, encourage so them to Yeah, so if they, if they stay within those limits, they are probably a more casual user yeah. um, and getting the, the value out of it that they're getting. And I'm more fine with that than... Yeah. Uh, you know, frequent high yeah. uh, frequency use and right. not paying for it. Yeah, there's, it, it's great when you, uh, it's good to have customers using your product and being really happy about it, but it's always better if they pay for it. So exactly. You gotta get, so Le what? Le you have to get comfortable with leakage, right? If you're gonna yeah. go freemium, you, have, it's, you just have to know what your leakage tolerance is and, and there's other ways to compensate for it. So you and I were talking about this this morning. You know, if you, if you can find other ways to double your at-bats, mm -hmm. uh, but your close rate or your leakage, your close rate goes down or your leakage rate goes up. It doesn't help it, much. It, it, right. Well, no, it may cancel each other out. Right, so there right. may be ways to mitigate it. It might be worth, if adoption and usage is important to you uh, during a certain phase of your growth, yeah. Uh, to get the word out, to you yeah. know, to lower your overall cost of sale, or whatever the strat yeah. the go-to-market strategy is, then yeah. leakage leakage might be, you know, if you know what it is yeah. and you can manage it, it might be a perfectly acceptable yeah. variable in, in your strategy. Yeah, that's I mean, that goes back to what we were saying before, which is what is the strategy? If the strategy is awareness and you're launching, then leakage you may not care about, or you may not care about the people aren't paying initially exactly. during some period just to get as many people as you can using using the product. Yeah. That's well, a great for product. us it tied really well yeah. into the strategy. So the two yeah. things we found, one was in the free trials, which for a collaboration offering, it was hard to get people to adopt and mm -hmm. engage because by the time they started getting to know the product mm -hmm. and they got the rest of their team on the product, the trial expired. So you know, that, didn't, that, that didn't work so well. The second thing is, is that from a land and expand perspective, you know, what we want is more, the more and more people within an organization using the product because the more people use it and engage in it, we can then, our salespeople can then go to the CIO and say, Look, you've already got 100, 200, 300 people in your organization that are using this thing. Don't you want to control it, manage it? Uh, you know, and this is this is the classic land and expand strategy. So for us, the more free people are using it inside the organization, the easier it becomes for us to convert that into a paid organization. So you know, you, we, we yeah, had, it's um, good, Bill. We yeah. had at Marketo, you know, I hear Brian saying he's going away from that model, and I, I wish I could do a freemium model because um, Marketo now is a little bit better known in the marketing automation space is mm -hmm. a little more well established but in 2008 when we launched it we were still educating people on what it was and so it's not conducive to the self-service model you have to go and transfer knowledge which means yeah. I need to do an enablement and so the way we went about it was we did a free trial we made the free trial two weeks mm -hmm. and we gave you a free enablement but we forced the customer to sign a contract and it said for those two weeks you can opt out for any reason in the world that you want but at the end of that, it converts into a full 12 month agreement. And we did that because it really eliminated the tire kickers, because we had a lot of people knocking on our door saying that. And we got a lot of people upset. It eliminated the what? I'm sorry. The didn't... tire kickers. The tire kickers, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, had, yeah. we had a lot of people knocking on our door saying, I want the free trial. And knowing that we were going to go invest six or eight hours on the back office, doing education, <laughs> setting up landing pages, enabling yeah. this thing, we knew we couldn't support that model. Yeah. So we had to find a way that kind of separated the the, the high-valued yeah. people that were interested. You couldn't justify that the, the cost of having that trial. That's right. The, um, ours, ours was just like Marketo's, yeah. particularly because we're more used by mid-market and enterprise, yeah. that the free trial really attracted kind of lower lifetime value users who actually had higher support costs. Right. So we actually, the same kind of thing, it takes a little bit of education and implementation. Yeah. We found that free trial yeah. just didn't drive high lifetime I mean, that's value. an interesting point. There are these hidden costs that may not be apparent. It sounds, it all sounds great when you when you launch these models, but if you aren't doing sort of this analysis that you're doing on on how to manage that, maybe that's just a level of maturity, right? It you is. Got, I mean, you got to iterate even on the free trial. Five years, four or five years yeah. worth of, of data yeah. that we can look at. You know, it's it's everything from yeah. conversion rates to usage patterns of the free product. Uh, that we can, you know, really tweak and tune, yeah. optimize the model based on that. Yeah. And I just want to clarify, I'm not going away from freemium. Yeah. Um, but we are definitely. It's a modif It's a modification. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But Bill, your point's interesting too, because and and we had this discussion briefly in the in the call when we were preparing for this, that you know, free and free trial freemium may not be right for every type of application or tool. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you're saying in Marketo it wasn't really. It's hard to justify it. 
Who else, does anyone else have comments on that, either in your current companies or other experiences you've had, where it just doesn't really, even though you'd like yeah. to do it, because it seems like a great way to acquire or drive yeah, awareness? A, I've seen a checkbox, a list of checkboxes yeah. somewhere in terms of, is your business Ready for a good it, yeah. fit for, for freemium? Yeah. You know, there's, yeah. there's some well-known criteria, yeah. Yeah. right? If it's something that lends itself to virality, for example, that's usually a pro, right? Or if, if the cost, cost to serve is, is very high, then that's probably not a good thing, right? Because if you have a whole bunch of free users, you're not going to be able to right. pay for that. Um, so there's a bunch of these criteria yeah. that you can... I think it, it depends on what is that moment of truth when the customer realizes value. If, they, if it's fairly turnkey and they can get to value mm -hmm. on, on their own, mm -hmm. then, then that makes sense. But if, you, if it takes some work or some education or implementation before they get to that aha moment of, oh, this is great, I love this, that's, that's what I think is really gonna drive whether or not yeah. a free trial is gonna work for you. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, let me shift to, um, to retention or upsells, right? I mean, we, you, know, you guys are all growth companies, uh, clearly, so acquisition is, is top of mind. But um, have you thought about using pricing and packaging differently to, to either retain or to upsell? You know, we kind of group these things together. Um, I don't know, Chris, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, so we, we kind of try to keep it simple. Um, and because our, the way our customers grow with us is they just consume more of the same. So whether it's seats, and the, a lot of the, for you guys, I think it's all seats. For us, it's uh, compute capacity, kind of yeah. more of an Amazon model. Um, and usually when they get going, you know, if they get to product, if for us, it's if they get their system into production, they get their, their integration into production, you know, we, we have incredibly small churn, I mean, less than 10% loss once they're in production. And if you add in add-ons, our, our numbers last year were like 190%, so we have negative churn uh, because they just, they use more and use more and use more. Um, so we don't try and, ch we, don't, we don't use pricing, we don't have different pricing for the expand. Um, we certainly have new packages or add-on packages that they can come and, you know, maybe now they want to um, they want to move out into the cloud with their integration or maybe they want to add more endpoints or they want to mm -hmm. um, start doing API related things. We have other products for that. So they're add -ons. But for the for any one product, we just try and keep it really simple. For us it's just pretty pretty yeah. linear and simple. So do you, so add-ons is certainly one strategy to get drive more mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. out of each customer. What, how do others think about add-ons versus additions or, or the, the sort of the trade-off between I, those? I think yeah, Chris brought up simplicity, which is really important. Yeah. Um, you know, I look back and Marketo in 2008 launched as a single product company and then in 09, two products. In 10, we had three products. And we were selling a lot to the SMB. And so all of a sudden, one day I looked at a quote and I saw, you know, today we're five products. I saw five products down the page times the number of users, times the start date, the end date, times the list price, the discount, and the net price. And I was like, this looks really complex for yeah. a company buying a $15,000 package. <laughs> and that was what drove me to say, let's go to the simplicity model and maybe do the bundling or the addition type of thing. Because then it's just one line with you get yeah. this bundle and these are your start dates and this is your price. And it just pushed that way. And it also opened up the door for doing the upsell much easier because to that point, you know, if uh, if you know somebody that's buying our stuff is taking a quote and walking it through their organization, and they see eight line items. Mm -hmm. That doesn't look easy. That just looks complex. I'm not sure I want to engage in that. And that was not what I wanted to be messaging. And so I think the evolution to the bundles was a an effort to try and keep the simplicity that we initially started the business with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, we, I, yeah, I agree on the idea of, of simplicity. So we've done two things. One, in our initial contracts, we will offer a bundled price for a, for a future cross-sold product. So as I said, you could have a subscription to your website and a subscription to your analytics. So in the initial deal, we'll say, if you choose to add on an analytics subscription, that will give you a discounted price. But we'll put that in the initial contract so that gives them a path towards upsell or an incentive towards upsell. Mm -hmm. And the second thing we do is, is we, we do continue to try and find that simplicity of, of creating bundles and discounts for a natural path mm -hmm. to, to adding a subsequent subscription where we also add on um, an ad campaign, which we can bundle in. But the bundling is definitely a great way for simplicity. Yeah, I like that idea, too, of having a path when a customer begins. So it's right. not just for saying, here's what you get, and then you have to figure out down the road wh where the path is. If you, if you actually say, here's where you're going to start, yep. and if you continue with us, here are the things you could get at a certain discount based on that path exactly. you're buying. So exactly. it's almost like a path, of, of it's a bundled path. It's almost. a bundled path yeah. at the initial sale. Yeah. that leads, gives them an incentive to do that upsell 
faster than yeah. faster than uh, faster than later. That's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Well, one thing we do on the upsells, I don't know if you guys do, on the up on the add-on uh, side. Once they've kind of got their base usage in place, is is we're seeing multi-year subscriptions becoming more mm -hmm. requested more and more, mm -hmm. um, and I think it has to do with them wanting to set their budget, know their budget way way out. Um, and, and those are a little tricky to do sometimes in the enterprise, but um, but we're seeing much much more demand in the last year from multi-year, which I surprised me. I don't, I don't yeah. know if uh, we're, we're yeah. seeing it too. We we um, we really had the conflict of we wanted multi-year agreements because predictability for yourselves mm -hmm. as well, and we saw customers wanting the flexibility of of not wanting Short it. So term, we yeah. we inserted a thing that if you didn't opt for the multi-year, there was an automatic price escalator in your contract that said next year's price will increase by this much. And it was really an effort to recapture discount that you probably gave at the initial <laughs> deal cycle. And, um, and that, that trigger catches people and they say, wait, I don't want a, a price increase. And that we leads you in. right yeah. into the multi-year agreement. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you make them prepay the multi-year? I wish I could get that down. <laughs> <laughs> Cash is so, yeah. so the challenge. We, so we've debated this one quite a bit because our, our, like I said, our churn rates are low. Yeah. So what's our incentive to lock them in? I'd rather up, you know, you know, if all things are equal and it's hard to rip me out, then, yeah. then you know, I'd like to have a price increase every year. So we've, that's one that we so don't. View, yeah, your view is we don't have a you, good you don't answer. Feel like you yeah. need to give that discount. I think. The, yeah. But Bill was saying the driver, you know, was maybe less about retention, more about just stability. You know, maybe maybe retention as yeah, well. Yeah, that's the yeah. trade-off is predictability. Yeah. But if I already have, yeah. you know, ninety-two yeah. percent renewal rates, I already have a lot of predictability. Yeah, it's not worth as much to our business to have yeah. that predictability. It's worth it to them to fix their costs. But what's the time value of money right, right equation? And, yeah. and so I don't. Have, we don't. We haven't had a great. I think if you have a higher churn business, it makes a ton of sense yeah. to do. Um, and the investors like to have those yeah. stuff under contract, yeah, but. Um, but again, it depends, I guess, on the behavior yeah. of your subscriptions. And your let me before I'm going to let you respond, Brian. I know I want to make sure uh, we get questions from the audience. So, do we have a roaming mic? Who does? I don't know if we. I think we have one, right? You, yeah, you expect We'll get one. Um, so I'll just. That's the cue to just. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, 15 minutes. So if you have questions, get them ready. I'm going to uh, ask one more question, then we'll open up. Brian, why don't you speak, and then I'll. Yeah, sure. So I just uh, I was going to point out that we use our, our freemium model in another clever way to. Um, uh, land, in our land and expand uh, model, which is, um, you know, if we're at an, a, an account where they maybe have uh, 500 seats of Salesforce, uh, which we implement and integrate into, and they say they only want to start with, say, uh, you know, 50 seats to get going, or that's their power users, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll deploy all 500 seats. They'll get the 50 that they're paying for, and the other 450 will put the free product in. Um, uh, and they'll uh, just have full access to that. And then, of course, we're monitoring and nurturing uh, those other users. So it's a great way for us to get into the account. And uh, then we go back, and obviously, we, we upsell to expand our, yeah. our seats yeah. um, based on usage and, uh, of the product. Who else is doing, last question that we'll open up, who else is doing usage, usage-based pricing? Yeah, we're, yeah or, that was or one or of the know. things we, yeah. we struggled with a lot because, again, we wanted to keep things very, very simple. Um, but at the same time, our COGS model has a usage element to yeah. it, and we had to we had to have some level of usage charging as well. And so we struggled a lot with how to do that and still keep the model simple. So where we ended up was uh, there is you know there's the basic subscription, and on top of that, there's there's basically minute packages that you can buy um, that are usage based. So it's basically audio credits that you you get that auto top off when 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 they uh, when they're done. So. We're building kind of a new model that I don't think I've seen anywhere, similar to a usage model, but it's advertising as subscription. Mm -hmm. So instead of ad campaigns where you say you've got a budget of X and run the campaign, we'll, we'll sell it almost like usage mm -hmm. and turn campaign dollars into recurring revenue dollars. So it's trying to take a usage model and apply it in a new space. Uh, there's some complexity to it, but it's uh, it's really profitable when it works. Have you launched that? Already? Yes. Yeah, yep. we've got I think we've got a handful of customers. Okay. It actually aligns very well to shifting kind of marketing programs. One of the other things, you know, when you think about subscription economy, I think to note is you know the role of marketing changes dramatically, yeah. as these guys have all said, from just handing leads to kind of managing engagement across the customer lifecycle. So you're always marketing to somebody. You're, you know, and it's just as they go through the customer lifecycle. So you start to align 
marketing products similar to you know, Marketo to how do you, you're always going to be targeting them, you're just going to target them with something different based upon where they are. So we're going to innovate that around advertising as well. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Postpaid versus prepaid was another kind of really difficult thing, right? There's a lot of risk Payment in, in the standard, yeah, yeah, yeah. The standard yeah. usage models that yeah. are supported in, in most of the systems are, are in arrears. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of risk you carry there, especially with, with end users versus entire you yeah. know, in, in terms of the offer. implications on cost, you right. know, if you're not tracking it. Yeah. So we, we, had, we ended up implementing a prepaid offering for our usage. Yeah, just to manage that better. Yeah. It's more predictable, yeah. All right, let me, let me open it up. This is a, a great group of people, so please bring the questions, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, when you're talking to the CFO of a, uh, of a prospect, and they're comparing the pricing of an on-premise solution uh, versus a SaaS solution. What kind of ratios do you, you see in terms of the months for the crossover? And are they considering, obviously, it's the, uh, the upfront cost plus the maintenance fees and, and maybe the, uh, their, their internal cost of hosting. But are there any ratios that you, you see and do you try and stay consistent Actually, Chris, with? you might want to answer this one because I think you, you have both on-premise and cloud-based yeah, pricing, right? Yeah, uh, I, I will say you'll, you'll see the one that's the most advantageous to their negotiating position, which generally is a really long time horizon. Um, Look, I, I think you know you uh, you can always try and do the whole TCO versus an on-premise based solution, and there's all kinds of ways you can do that. You can add in hardware costs. You can add all kind. You know, if you're on-prem and they're on-prem, you, you know, um, if you're doing cloud to on-prem, then you got to figure out that you know how efficient are they at their data center? What's their you know you got to do that if if they're trying to figure that out. But generally, what I'm not I'm not seeing any more those kind of debates about the cost of public cloud or SaaS versus private cloud. I don't see that. I'm seeing that decline. I think everybody's kind of getting their head around the public clouds way more uh, cost efficient. But um, what what we do talk a lot about, what we sell very aggressively and kind of lean in on is subscription models are a better. It's a more honest business model. I have to re-earn 100% of my revenue with you every single year. My competitors that are on the old model, they're going to get this big perpetual license up front, and they put 20% at risk year after year. I'm put 100% every year. Which which relationship would you rather be in, you know, from a vendor standpoint? And that does resonate. I mean, that that you can actually start to have a meaningful conversation around, uh, and and you know, and then you go into your support stats and your SAT and all, all the normal things that you do around that. But but. Uh, we are seeing overwhelmingly people like that model better. The customers are big enterprises in particular responding to that model better. Yeah, that, I, I like that. It's an honest business model. There is an element of that. Yeah, but sometimes yeah. you can even say, well, typically I've seen a 30 to 36 months crossover. Uh, 30 to 36 months cross over, you know, from from when you have both kind of mm -hmm. products and just kind of wondered what. And I think anywhere from three to five, and the customer will always run a seven and say, wow, you guys are way more expensive than. You know, this on-premise old thing that's 15 years old, and you're like, okay, really? What, what <laughs> about this idea of an honest business model and transparency? One of you brought up uh, in your opening remarks yeah. about, um, you know, disclosing pricing very openly, you know, on, on the internet. You know, what's the what's your take on that? Anyone have an opinion you want to share about? I, I brought it up, so I'll just give you our perspective. Yeah. Is um, like I said, if you prescribe that buyers are finding you, then it's um, then it works really well. And the concept that we had was when we came to market, you're looking for differentiators and none of our competitors showed their pricing. And so for us, it, it, was, it was a you know, kind of a gut-wrenching discussion and decision to make, but we really did have a North Compass set that we wanted to be a transparent company with our customers and even our prospects that were looking at us. And so we did it. And you know, what I can say is five years later, every one of our competitors posts their pricing. And so they responded to that move because it was, you know, the definition of a differentiator is something you're doing that they're, they're not. not. Right. And if that's all of a sudden attracting people to you, I mean, like, anybody look at a real estate magazine, you're flipping through and you're like, oh, that's a great house. And then one says price upon request, and you're like, you don't even look at it. You, you move on because you can't put a context of, is that a $5 million house, a $1 million house, or whatever. And so that's what we kind of looked at was the buying behaviors. It kind of, you're going down a process and it just kills the process right then when you get to a point, mm -hmm. at, at least for SAT, at least for SaaS applications, yeah. you should probably qualify that. Yeah, yeah, great comment. We have a question here Are in there the other questions? Yeah, great. So that's a maybe question targeted to uh, Bill because he, he brought it up. So you talked about incentivizing multi-year 
agreements, and you mentioned that you tell the customer up front that they'd have a price increase next year. I think about the only other vendor I know that tells me that is maybe Gartner. Uh, <laughs> so how did you deal with the objections around that? Because if I'm a customer, I might take that negatively. And any other from the panelists, any other yeah, ways to I, incentivize? Absolutely. If I sold at list price, I would definitely get the objection. But if I gave you a 25% discount, I'm basically telling you if you're mm -hmm. renewing, back to Chris's point, it means I'm adding some value to your business and I should probably be in a position, remember the SaaS model is I'm delivering constant product to you over iterative periods. And so by giving you more product and giving you updates for free, I think I'm somewhat entitled to be able to ask for a small, I mean, it's, it's a 7% increase. And so if you think about, I paid a, $100 was the list, I got a 25% discount, so it's 75 net and I'm getting a 7% increase you know, I'm all of a sudden, you know, paying $6 more, you know, or whatever. So it's not a huge uptick that I'm sticking them with, and it wasn't to try and upset them. It was for the purpose that I could recapture and see some growth that they're renewing against and they're seeing value on. But you, and you're also just being transparent. I mean, it goes back to the theme of just honesty. You're, when, you, when you have that conversation up front, it's much easier than at the time of renewal, right? Well, everybody's yeah. budgeted right. at the time of renewal, yeah. and they're like, hey, sorry, this is what I paid last year, this is what I budgeted yeah. this year. And so you're kind of locked right. in. You're, you're, at that point, it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. We, we do the same thing. And the other, you know, on the transparency point, the other thing that we do that we, we find really helps is, is leverage analytics and data. Right? So if, mm -hmm. if people in the enterprise, if more and more people in the enterprise are adopting the solution and using it and engaging with it, then it's clearly worth more. And, and, so that's, and we know collaboration takes time until it's adopted inside the enterprise. And that's why we'll start with a lower price in year one and, and increase it over time as people use it more. And if they're not, then you know we can have a different conversation. So Great. it all puts the pressure on us. But I think we have Great time question. for two yeah. more. Here's Hopefully, one. Yeah. Uh, yes. Can you talk a little bit about um, licensing to larger enterprises where you have multiple business units and the and how you deal with volume licensing in that case? Someone want to take that? We we do quite a bit of licensing to larger business yeah. units, and so we we try and. Uh, we have a couple of ways of describing it, but it's always trying to find a carve out for selling to a unit. And we kind of look at it by selling to a budget. Mm -hmm. And what can we use to define a budget? Um, and and we, that's where the bundling comes right in, right? which is a, if an additional business unit wants to license our platform, we would give them a discount um, on a prescribed term. But it's really just a matter of finding different budget owners. and each one of those becomes an incremental sales opportunity. So they all take advantage of the volume-based pricing, but you're setting that model out up front yep. for that account. Yeah. Yep. I, I yep. also think the, it, you know, I think you're kind of getting into the ELA kind of mm -hmm. enterprise license agreements, what used to be in, 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 the, old, you know, in the old days. Um, <laughs> it, you know, I think the cool part of we, that we all have in our new model is it has a term. Right? So at some point, you're going to go get what you can get for the, where the customer's at in their usage amount of usage for the near term period of time, right? And so whether you do a two or three year um, license, you know, enterprise agreement or division wide agreement, you can kind of try and box it a lot of different ways. But you know, we, we put a tremendous amount of upfront discussion in around what's your real usage, what's your real usage going to be, what other groups are coming on, you know, like we try and work with them because boy, you know, our, our ELAs are really expensive. So um, you know, you, it's, we got to really plan with you. And then we end always end up kind of in a right size. But yeah, you know what? For a period of time, uh, we'll let you use as much as you want. And because we know what that time period is, and we know generally what they're going to do. And boy, when they get to the end of that thing, if they've actually increased their usage that much, guess what the next renewal is going to be? We're going to be having a huge upsell discussion about the next five divisions. And the price won't be any, you know, you know again, it shouldn't be anywhere near what it was for the first term. Um, and they should be happy to pay it if they're getting 20 more divisions onto the product. So, um, so I, I think with I think you actually I think doing ELAs on a perpetual is the worst because you're just giving it away forever. And now the only thing you could do is go cram more product down their throat, whether they want it or not. And uh, and so again, I think it back to the more honest. It's a more honest business model. It's a more transparent business model. And I, I think we found really intelligent customers in those. I mean. They actually like that approach quite a bit, and um, it's refreshing. It's new to them, and they've never had those discussions before, which is quite, you know, quite fun. Hmm. It's all about the customer relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a question we, up here? Yeah, we. Had, we do, had should one we do two first. more? Okay. Yeah. 
Hey, how you doing? Um, I really appreciate all the comments about it. And uh, all the subscription models, I feel like it uh, can be ideal and can be optimized for a certain audience. And where the biggest assault on a consistent uh, subscription model is dealing with large enterprise and their demands and their customizations. Um, even something like uh, putting it on the website. I think for the most part, most people put up their pricing except for enterprise pricing, right? That's a pretty, pretty common one. Uh, what's been your path in terms of trying to maintain a consistent subscription model without caving in to what large enterprise is looking for and, and basically how they're buying? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it was one of the drivers for us that did take us to bundles because, as you know, you get to a large enterprise and they have professional procurement groups and they all of a sudden start a la carting everything and they start trying to reverse engineer your pricing and you're just saying, look, no, this is just a bundle price. And they're saying, yeah, but I see the individual prices and I only want, you know, and they start playing those games. Yeah. Um, so that is the biggest challenge. And it, it's one of those drivers that you just get to the point of, of, of pushing yourself to a bundle or an addition or some type of thing. And so um, we saw that because uh, most of our organization had been through that movie before where we had seen. And so we tried to preempt it and just get it out there ahead of time. And the benefit for us was, yes, it was out there and publicly available versus our competitors for a long time, it wasn't. So at least we were talking about, you know. Did you, did you publicize that on the website? Did you do special bundles? Um, no, but we would do promotions um, that would show up not typically on the website. Push out promotions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Great question. Um, one more? All right. So I, I don't know, Bill, it might be a softball for you, but um, when you guys are building your, your pricing strategy and, and a freemium, thinking about freemium or 30-day th trial, do you factor in the cost of lead nurturing or a sales development team, inside sales, how that's going to play into uh, the pricing strategy, whether you do freemium, whether you do 30-day trial? Um, honestly, no right now because we're a pretty high growth organization. We measure everything of what's our cost per name, cost per lead, cost per op, cost per deal. So we have all those, those metrics, but we haven't really utilized that yet to, to affect our pricing. I think there will be a day that we get there. We have also not gone to the utility-based pricing, which I think there will be a day based on consumption that we have a component. But um, right now, just in a high growth mode, it hasn't been uh, a top agenda item for us. You tracking all that in some marketing automation tool? Oh, here we are. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Want to make sure. <laughs> it's a great tool. We use Marketo too. Uh, 